section three. <laughs> and uh, Jim, we'll start with the total maximum daily load incentive package. Yes, sir. The uh, Green Ribbon Committee has been working for some time to come up with uh, proposed or some at least thoughts on an incentive package to address uh, TMBLs and Clay Burnick, our environmental administrator, to introduce our topic. Clay, glad to have you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council Members. Uh, I'm here today with uh, two other folks who are going to really be the, the bulk of this briefing. That would be folks from your appointed Green Ribbon Committee. Uh, one of our co-chairs is here today, Wayne McCoy, and then also the chair of one of their subcommittees. The group is organized into subcommittees, and Karen Forget with Lenhaven River now is the chair of their incentive subcommittee. We welcome you both. And uh, I'm going to give you some background information very quickly. So put on your seat belts. We're going to run through some of these first slides pretty fast, and then we're going to turn it over to <coughs> Karen to give you some of the details on the recommendations that the committee has been working through. In terms of an overview, uh, some background on TMDLs in general, adopted TMDLs that we have in Virginia Beach at this time, pending TMDLs that may develop at some point down the road, uh, out of the state's impaired waters list and their roles in stormwater and then some of the role of the Clean Water Task Force and Green Ribbon Committee with TMDLs and then to their recommendations. Uh, in terms of background, uh, a TMDL is basically, I like to think of it as a pollution diet. If you go to your physician and he says, you know, you've put on a little bit of weight over the holidays, you need to get back to this target, you've exceeded your target, that's basically what a TMDL is. It's a pollution diet for a waterway for different parameters. There are two kinds of adopted TMDLs in Virginia Beach, Chesapeake Bay TMDLs and local TMDLs. And I'm not going to read through all of the bullets here, but suffice it to say for the Chesapeake Bay TMDLs, they cover the entire Bay watershed. There are different TMDL limits or diet targets established in different sub-segments of the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So we're in within one of those sub-segment areas and uh, other parts of the Bay Watershed had of other targets. Those TMDLs are focused around three basic, basic pollutants being sediment, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Um, when we put together our program at the state level, we put together some practices to try to accomplish those targets starting with a, a what's called a watershed implementation plan or WIP. And there were two phases to that. The interim targets for the WIP 1 were 2.5 million pounds of nitrogen and a half million pounds of phosphorus by 2025. That's for the Commonwealth as a whole. And then each of these subsegments has a portion of that broken out as a target. Then there's also a WIP phase 2 that was completed in March of 2012. And it got a little more specific in terms of practices to help meet those goals, looking at revised stormwater management regulations, uh, stormwater program improvements, urban nutrient management, and then local strategies, developing local targets, which gets down to where we really kind of dwell here at the, at the city level. Other adopted TMDLs that we have in Virginia Beach are called local TMDLs, and they're required for certain waterways that have been determined impaired by the Department of Environmental Quality. We currently have established uh, a series of those that have been in place for various lengths of time, some for the Back Bay watershed, primarily for bacteria and phosphorus, some in the Elizabeth River watershed for bacteria, the Lynn Haven for bacteria, and in the North Landing River for bacteria and phosphorus as well. Our most significant work in terms of actions have been focused, of course, on the Lynn Haven in terms of, of trying to achieve reductions in that bacteria loading, which corresponds to our uh, boating pump out regulations and no discharge zone in the Lynn Haven, a lot of the septic system replacement with sanitary sewers by our public utilities department, and then of course all of our stormwater retrofits and the uh, poster child and the result of that has been more of the river reopened to shell fishing. There are other waterways in Virginia Beach, some of them overlap the ones I just mentioned, where there are potential DMDLs, and I call them potential because uh, the Commonwealth at some point has the option of taking waters that are on the state's uh, impaired waters list that's updated regularly, 
and they may establish that there are requirements to develop TMDLs for these. And these include the whole list of what I have up here for back bay looking at dissolved oxygen and pH, the bay watershed for PCBs, the Elizabeth River for aquatic life and PCBs, the Little Creek watershed for chlorophyll, dissolved oxygen, PCBs, and phosphorus, the Lynn Haven for aquatic life, mercury, and PCBs, the North Landing for dissolved oxygen and PCBs, and then the Rudy Owls Creek area for dissolved oxygen bacteria. And those have not been established as TMDLs, but there's potential that that could happen later. So put it together with the Chesapeake Bay TMDLs, the ones we have already established in these others, uh, we'll be dealing with TMDLs for some time. The roles of those TMDLs in our stormwater program, and I think of this in the broadest sense, not just Public Works, who is the owner of this, but in terms of, of the city organization and the community as well, is to help define quality priorities for water quality that need to be addressed. It helps to develop targets and define a framework for actions and plans and strategies, many of which you've been hearing about at different briefings, things such as uh, work on cleaning up Thalia Creek, some work along Mill Dam Creek in the Great Neck area, other parts of the city. And it can also help define city responsibilities for permitting reporting requirements. Some of this information can find its way into our reporting requirements for, for our stormwater permits. The Clean Water Task Force mission uh, is on the next slide. I'm not going to read through these bullets, but they serve pretty much as a staff and community-based group that meets, used to be monthly, but now every other month, to help identify and communicate what everybody is doing individually and have a coordinated strategy and approach to what we're doing with water quality improvements. Uh, they have helped frame the issue of trying to track what our practices are, both within the city organization and the community, so that we can begin to see what is working, where it's working, what other kind of options might be out there to help us meet these TMDL targets. Um, along with that, they have been directed, and this is reflected on your council pending items list, to help develop and implement a tracking system for what we're doing with these different practices. Uh, and the membership is the following page of city departments and community groups and other folks in the city who are invited but at current time aren't participating in the group. The Green Ribbon Committee, of course, is a creature of you, and uh, you gave them a charge which included the specific reference of monitoring implementation of TMDL requirements of EPA and overseeing public involvement in the development of new ordinances or practices. So that group, as it was reconstituted uh, about two years ago, has met, has had a lot of briefings and information sessions from, from folks in the city and other agencies as to practices and projects and where we stand on different things to get them up to speed. And then they have most recently been looking at putting together recommendations to come back to city council and then how that TMDL requirement might be, be achieved. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Karen, who can give you a little more detail. And uh, the next slide did just show some of the, the membership that you've appointed and the different groups represented. Okay. Thank you very much, Karen. We welcome you. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to kind of bring you up to date on one, what one of the subcommittees of the Green Ribbon Committee has been working on. Um, as Clay said, you task us with looking at ways that we can improve water quality and especially compliance with the TMDLs that Clay outlined. Um, we understand, as you do, that we aren't going to meet these requirements with city projects alone, that we have to have the involvement and the cooperation of private property owners if we're going to meet these new water quality standards. So the incentive subcommittee, which I chair, has been really looking at ways to incentivize private property managers to, uh, to step it up, to, to improve stormwater management both on existing property as well as new development, but really especially existing developed property. 
Um, we're proposing this afternoon four things that we've been working on. A new clean water cost share program that I'll go into more detail on. A green ribbon award program. Um, and increasing training opportunities both for city staff as well as for the development community and others and development of a comprehensive incentive program so stormwater is the issue stormwater is how the pollutants get into the surface water and you know very well that you know most of our stormwater goes directly back into the surface water in the northern part of the city the most developed area of the city 80 percent of our stormwater goes directly back into the surface water every time it rains only tw about 20 percent of it has any kind of of pre-treatment before it goes into this back into the surface water. So when it rains, stormwater runs off of parking lots, roads, uh, buildings, um, and, ca and our lawns, and carries with it everything that it encounters along the way. So if we're going to improve water quality, we have to both reduce the pollutants that are in stormwater, and we have to reduce the volume of stormwater. So that's kind of what we're looking at with the, pro with the practices that we're incentivizing. Um, the, this clean water this clean water cost share program is designed to incentivize property managers and property owners to uh, install new stormwater management on-site stormwater management applications on their property including some of the following uh, parking lot retrofits so we can go from the picture in the top uh, left to the one in the bottom right to improved, improved stormwater management from parking lots. And as you know, we have a lot of those top left um, situations in Virginia Beach. Rain gardens that improve where we can go from the turf to, to managing some of the runoff on site. Rain gardens are a really good way to manage water on site and keep it out of the stormwater system. And they can be applied in small, on smaller residential properties as well as commercial properties. And other practices like rain barrels, cisterns, bioretention, pervious pavers, all practices that are well vetted and that are part of the TMDL clearinghouse and have been approved for TMDL credits. And by the way, some of these practices also have the added benefit of reducing localized flooding because it in a rain event because it keeps the, the water on site, manages the water on site, and can help to, uh, in addition to controlling stormwater and improving stormwater, can help uh, with localized flooding. So the, the way the clean water... Uh, cost share program would work is that we're requesting $200,000 from next year's budget, not this year, next year's budget, the 2015-2016 budget. 75% of that money or $150,000 would be allocated to commercial properties and 25%, 50% would be allocated for applications uh, for retrofits on residential properties. So the, the kinds of things that I showed you rain gardens, parking lot retrofits, cisterns, all of those kinds of practices are the kinds of things that we're trying to incentivize with this program. Property owners would apply, just like uh, you would fill out an application for a grant, they would apply for these funds, the cost share funds, um, and a committee set up by the Green Ribbon Committee and working in cooperation with city staff would review the applications and choose the, the ones that we think are the best and have the most potential both for TMDL credit as well as for educational value. Um, and then those recommendations would come back to the city council for approval before any awards, awards are made. Um, all projects would be required to have at least a one-to-one -one match. So that means that the property owner would be matching the funds provided by the city. So the city would be providing half of the money, the property owner would be providing half of the money, at least half. In some cases, they might provide more than half of the funding, but at, at minimum, a one-to-one -one match. And the property owner would um, also be required to provide a maintenance agreement for the 
um, the technique or the application that they're installing, and it would need to be completed within one year of the award. And then the you know the biggest reason for this there it's, it has double benefits, but but one is certainly to get some of these practices in the ground so we can get TMDL credit for them, but the bigger benefit is to have models for the community. Um, you know, we've all heard that a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, one parking lot retrofit that other people can see is worth a thousand workshops and a thousand brochures and a thousand times of me telling people that this is a great thing to do. So we really feel like getting some of these models in the ground and having the city's cooperation, the city's participation in getting some of these models built would pay off in the long run to really encourage other property owners to think about things that they can do on their property and really just raise the level of, of awareness and uh, participation from the private sector in managing stormwater. Uh, each commercial site would have educational signage. Uh, that's what would be one of the requirements too, and we would help design that educational signage. And commercial sites would need to be available for tours and for other kind of workshops or other educational opportunities. Um, Another advantage of this program, I think, is that it really requires, uh, it'll require very little time from city staff. Our stormwater staff are already very overworked with the new regs and all the other things that they're trying to get in place. So this program would require very, uh, just a minimal amount of city staff time. And we would get some real reductions as well as some good uh, educational models. And it doubles the city's money because the city, half of the money is coming from the private sector. So that's the first proposal, and that one would be, um, it would affect next year's budget if the council decides to um, fund this project. The second one is the Green Ribbon Award Program, and for that we're asking for $5,000 uh, out of this year's budget, which is primarily just to, to provide some educational materials to, um, and to provide some award materials. And it would also be looking for those same kinds of practices that we'd, we'd be incentivizing with the cost share program. These could be th new, new projects as well as existing projects. And it would be another opportunity for us to um, showcase good practices, best practices, and use this as an educational tool. We would love to do, you know, we're ready to hit the ground with this award program, and we would love to announce the, the first awards at the, the State of the City address in March, if that was possible. And then the other two things that um, the incentives committee is working on, which are longer term is, or the first is really ongoing, is working with nonprofits and others to provide training both to the development community, to citizens and, and to um, others in how to better manage stormwater on site, what kinds of things private property owners can do, what kinds of things homeowners can do to help, to help us all toward this goal of clean water and meeting our TMDL requirements. Um, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation has offered two trainings uh, on the new stormwater regs. They're offering them over the next couple of months. And the first one, the December one, was filled within a few days. And the second one is at least half full, and it's only been out for like a week. So I think that that, that speaks to the need for this kind of training. And we're going to continue to work with other groups in um, providing those opportunities. And then the last thing we're working on is a comprehensive incentive program, which would include um, a review of the current stormwater fee uh, discount program, the stormwater fee reduction program that's in place now, as well as really reviewing what other localities are doing with uh, a bigger and, and broader, more comprehensive incentive program, and would um, really look at all kinds of incentives, not just monetary incentives, but other ways to incentivize property owners to look at ways that they can um, do a better job of managing stormwater on their own property, because that's the key to getting to cleaner water. It's the key to getting to, to, um, to meeting our TMDL goals is to manage stormwater better. 
So just to wrap it up, there are four things we're, we're talking about. The, the clean water cost share program, which we would be um, encouraging funding for in next year's budget and would be uh, managed through the Green Ribbon Committee. The Green Ribbon Award Program that we're asking for $5,000 from this year's budget to get off of the ground right away uh, with the first awards being made this spring, spring 2015. And then um, continuing uh, training opportunities and then we hope to be back here next fall uh, with a, a comprehensive incentive package for you to look at. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions on Amelia? Yeah, just wanted to ask, especially that you talk about training, where you also over at Kellum you have that green going on. Are you planning to do anything with the schools? Elementary high, because we need to start from there for them to be. Exactly. Um, I, I agree totally. I think education is a, is a part of everything. Um, Tim Cole uh, has worked with us on the Green Ribbon Committee and has been really proactive in, in um, not only in incorporating a lot of great practices into the new school buildings, but integrating it with the educational programs, the kiosks, the real-time information kiosks they have available are great tools for teachers. And um, through our uh, our Pearl School program that Lynn Haven River now does, we uh, we teach teachers how to use some of those tools, how to use the rain gardens as an educational tool, and other things like that. So it, this is all integrated in into the education program for sure. Brad, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this has obviously been on my radar screen for a while, and I think this is going to be one of the biggest challenges we face as a city in the coming years. How would you currently assess our analysis and our tracking of TMDL credits? Because that's going to be such a big thing. We, we've got dredging programs going on. We've got a lot of stormwater and, and overall water quality things going on that are so good for the environment. And then on the other hand, when these TMDL regulations and requirements come down, Virginia Beach is going to be a very high value target where somebody coming in from Richmond or somewhere else could find challenges in Virginia Beach and that would very quickly echo throughout the state. So I'm interested in, in how we're doing accounting for this stuff and then kind of secondarily, you talk about a $200,000 incentive program and one-to-one and -one cost sharing. The biggest, the biggest bang for our buck, I'm afraid, is not going to be, I, I don't want to minimize the value of reconstituting some of these parking lots or, or reformulating some of these commercial developments, but there are things that we can do, take a dredging project, for example, that instead of having Pembroke Mall totally refurb their entire parking lot, you take three more scoops with the backhoe in your dredging project and you've gotten the same uh -huh. value benefit. So where are we in currently analyzing and tracking our TMDL credits? And then is the $150,000 or the $200,000 really going to incentivize where you think it's going to go? Okay, I'll address the second part of that, and then I think Clay will, will um, be able to better answer the questions about the tracking system that the city is working on. Um, I think both are required. You know, we can... Um, uh, certainly dredging is going to provide benefits in some some cases, but if we're not doing something on the other end to uh, reduce sediment loads, then we're back in the same situation in another five years, seven years. We're right back where we started from. So we have to be doing both. And the whole idea of the, the, the cost share program is not that we're going to solve the problem of stormwater with $200,000, because no one knows that, you know, no one would think that that was possible. The idea of the cost share program is for us to, to be able to, with, with you guys, to really come up with the kinds of practices that are going to give Virginia Beach the most bang for their buck, that are going to be the most effective in helping us clean up our waters, reduce impervious surface, 
manage stormwater better on site, and then we can use this cost share program to get some of those practices in the ground where we can say, this is what you can do with your parking lot. Go look at this site. This is what you could do with your parking lot. This is how much it costs. These are some options that you might consider. Um, Pembroke is a good example. We have over 200 acres of impervious surface in Pembroke, in the old area of Pembroke, that drains directly into Thalia Creek with no stormwater management. So it's a good example of a place where no matter what we do in Thalia Creek, if we don't address the land side issues at the same time, we're, we're just going to keep getting back to the same place again and again. We have to do both. Before you hand it off to Clay, I have another question for you because you've talked wearing your Lynn Haven River Now hat about a lot of these initiatives, whether it's retrofitting or whether it's castle blocks for oyster spats, which is another mm -hmm. huge benefit to the, the water and the environment. What are the regulation difficulties with those and, and how are they different here in Tidewater? Because we've got low-lying and sinking ground, we've got high ground water. How is it different here than it is, and I'm sorry to get into this, how is it different here than, say, in Charlottesville or, say, in Annapolis or, or wherever else? And I know you're Lynn Haven River now, but... Right. Well, I, I, they're all a piece of the puzzle. They really are. And um, oyster castles are kind of a different different thing than they're not meant to really affect stormwater. So they're not really a stormwater management, but they are a water quality, um, a water quality practice. And they provide, obviously provide habitat for oysters when any way we can increase the number of oysters in, in all of our tidal rivers and is, is good for water quality. Um, they also help with shoreline erosion. They help to protect the wetlands behind. So they also have some value to to the, the property owner in protecting their shoreline and protecting the investment that they have in their property. Um, so that's, a, you know, that's a really kind of a different sort of, of practice. Um, then, and then the other part of your question was about some of these practices like rain gardens and bioretention in, a, in an area, a coastal area with high water tables. And there's no question that some of them are a little more challenging in some of our areas and some of our soils um, create more challenges. A, a rain garden is a little bit more complicated thing to build here than it would be in Richmond or Charlottesville, but it can be done. It requires amending of soil oils and some and uh, really some thoughtful approaches to it but but if it's done correctly it has the same benefit and the same impact thank you and you want to talk about tracking please the very tracking quickly. program's important <laughs> um, just very quickly to, to kind of give you an update on that the clean water task force and green ribbon committee recommended that a tracking system be developed we don't have to start from scratch we have good major pieces of that tracking system in place through a system that just happens to be called Hansen, not for our, our deputy city manager, but public works and public utilities enter in a lot of their information and we can pull a lot of that information out for city projects so that we know what we're doing and where and what kind of credits we get. We also have a similar kind of program that planning, housing, other departments use called a CELA and we're able to pull some information from the development review side there. The big piece that's missing is coordinating those together and also capturing the things that Lynn Haven Now and the other community groups are doing. So the idea is to pull this together into some kind of a spreadsheet so we can not only have this for reporting purposes to help us with meeting our, our permitting requirements, but but even more importantly, I think communicating back to you as city council and the community, the progress we're making so that we can almost do uh, kind of like you do with United Way with the temperature gauge and we can see where are we on this curve of trying to achieve the target. Thank you. I've got forward with John Moss and Rosemary. Um, well, this, this whole idea of incentives, um, in the first round of Green Ribbon Committee, which I think started around 2007 or so forth, we went through all of these kinds of potential things that could be done with, for stormwater. And, and at that time, you know, we were doing it because of just clean water and so forth. We didn't have this added push of the TMDLs hanging over us. And, you know, kind of the low-hanging fruit got uh, uh, adopted and then everything else set aside. But even at that time, we talked about incentives, but of course it was going to be costly and we didn't have that push, so it wasn't one of the things that came forward. 
Then along came, what, this TMDL thing, especially with the Chesapeake Bay, about four years ago. And remember the shock we all heard when we heard those numbers. They were just so awful, there was no way to even begin to think about us being able to afford them. But when we, we really start breaking down the things that we have done that we say give us credit, you know, we, we've got these possibilities. But I think, you know, those first numbers assumed that the, the government was going to have to do it all. And, uh, I mean, the kinds of things that were suggested were just totally beyond the thinking range. But I think as we have come to understand that the government can't begin to do it all, it's got to come from our citizens. And a lot of it has to just come with changed habits, changed way of doing things. And, and the way to, to, to encourage that to be done, I think, comes from, these, from incentive packages. And we are looking at all kinds of incentives that are being done by other localities all around. But one thing that just keeps coming back in all of the discussions is we really need examples. We need models. And so I think this, this idea of a cost share, it's, it's very much like things that the federal government's been doing for years, particularly with agriculture, you know, a cost share program to, uh, to help these things be instituted. And I, I think this is probably um, a, a relatively inexpensive way to get some of these models built because we can't. The, the, we can't, as a government, afford to do this kind of thing uh, on our own. We've just got to have the participation of our, our, our private sector, in commercial and in residential. And, and so it, it's bringing in everyone to do these things. And, you know, I kind of, I always go back to our sign ordinances. You know, we were going to kill the industry by, by changing, requiring these sign changes. But once they started being done, everybody decided to do them because they looked so much better and you know it's the peer pressure kind of thing and I, I really see this kind of thing once we start getting these parking lots to do the right thing or you know our, our residentials to do the right thing it's going to become the right thing because people are going to realize it so I think this is the idea behind the incentive program is to get our, our everybody on board because the government cannot possibly do it uh, by ourselves. We could never afford it. We, we sure don't want to charge that much on a stormwater fee, I can tell you. That's for and sure. I think this is the way to get it done. <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, John Moss. A couple of things. I want to come back to slide seven. And I think there's one before. That's the actual ones we're trying to do. I think I'd go back if you want. the actual ones we're trying to control. There's one that talks about the uh, ones where we're actually, oh, excuse me, slide six. Seven well, if I was saying like Lynn Haven River, for example, which is mostly surrounded by a lot, predominantly residential property, not commercial. Yes, sir. And I guess the suspended solid piece, it's hard to tell how big of the problem that is now that all the land is developed. But it says here that bacteria, fecal-based bacteria, is the biggest issue. I'm always asking about science. You know, if we're going to be doing something and having some, I'm not sure that's the right answer is this 200,000 thing, but I'll assume that is the right answer, is that we're basing it on, not on the return, on the impact, correct? So if we're saying, if we know from our outfall data collection analysis, and I don't know that we know this or not, but we should be able to check. You should be able to go to that outfall over on that little thing at the creek behind Pembroke Manor and check that water sample that comes off that huge parking lot. I bet there's not a lot of fecal matter in that particular parking lot would be my guess. I mean, a lot of brake shoe dust. You know, but so, so if that is our biggest concern, is our biggest way to attacking that problem of getting residential property to do things with their property because it's mostly coming off residential streets and therefore, so are we allocating the, the money to the right place. Right. I don't, I'd like to know the analysis that got us, and I'm not asking for the explanation here because I know we won't have a, it won't be analytical, it'll just be conjecture, but what's the analytical process that got us to say that the right balance for the fund was 75-25? I'd like to understand that a little bit better. And what data collection are we doing that would really tell us if we're looking around trying to get the biggest bang for the buck, where would we want to focus our attention 
The, the part about cost participation models, if they're not adequately funded, down the road no one wants to do one unless they get cost participation, and that becomes a major cost factor itself. Whereas if you use your public property, I'm not asking for a feedback, please. If we get any public participation at public property, then, then people can go look at the examples. But then as Rosemary was the first one, she deserves all the credit, really, for talking about this tax credit. Now you get a much bigger base, and their participation is the tax credit, which is a, a tax expenditure in that sense versus a monetary expenditure and you can get more participation so i think we have to be careful that we set a very bad precedent that we can't sustain going forward that a tax credit policy is much more broad based and gets a much larger participation and a bigger effect i think we need an analysis to determine that and i don't think that the advocates of the system are the best people to objectively look at it okay we'll go next to next uh is rosemary then we'll wind up rosemary I, I think that eventually that's where this group is going. But that's what we're going to be working on in the next year. But they wanted to do something now to get things started and to get some examples that people can go look at. And I'd really rather you talk about it more than myself because you've been more involved. But uh, if you'd like to explain to the council why you came up with the $200,000 to sort of kick this thing, sort of to kick it off as opposed to doing some other things. So I think the reasoning that y'all put into that will help because mm -hmm. they really agonized over this and they spent a lot of time discussing what was the best way to go, knowing that funding is limited. Um, but if you wouldn't mind explaining how you came to that. Conclusion. Sure. Um, we, um, Mr. Moss is right, a large part of the Chesapeake Bay um, watershed area of Virginia Beach is... Um, residential properties predominate, but 38% of, of the Lynn Haven watershed is impervious surface. And most of that 38% or a large part of that 38% is commercial property and roadways um, and parking lots. If you think about um, the Lynn Haven watershed, it includes town center and all of the development along Virginia Beach Boulevard. It includes the Rosemont area, which the the Rosemont SGA is over 80% impervious surface and includes Lynn Haven Mall and all of that development. So we have considerable commercial development in, in our Chesapeake Bay watershed. The Kempsville area, that's part of the Chesapeake Bay watershed also. So we have considerable commercial development. Um, and commercial property uh, projects are more expensive. And the, the percentage of impervious surface on a commercial site is much higher. Some of the, um, say, you know, take your typical car lot on Virginia Beach Boulevard, it may be 100% impervious surface. Uh, where a residential lot is going to be probably closer to 20 to 21, 22 percent impervious surface. Um, so the, the uh, potential to, to actually affect some significant improvement through a project on a commercial site is greater than on a residential site. Also, the practices are just less expensive. And we've had very uh, good cooperation from homeowners owners in putting in lots of these practices with their own dime and no cost share at all uh, with, you know, thousands of rain barrels installed and pervious pavers and removing turf and planting um, uh, planted beds and rain gardens and that kind of thing. So w with the, the residential in the residential cost share, what we were really looking at is some of the practices that we see less of. You see very few part. Uh, uh, driveways made from uh, pervious material. So getting some examples of places where people have removed their concrete or blacktop driveway and replaced it with a pervious driveway could be a really good example for others. And that's the, the kind of project that a homeowner may not undertake without some kind of, some kind of cost share benefit. Uh, commercial properties, I think we have, uh, we have a great need, as, as um, Mrs. Henley said, for models of what is possible. Um, the, 
the you know person who owns the little shopping plaza like where our office is the corner little plaza very typical of Virginia Beach uh, stormwater management is not at the top of their list of priorities they don't you know that's not something that they necessarily know very much about so this is a this is a, an opportunity to engage them in this process and to engage the private sector to a larger uh, degree to a much more effective degree I think in this in understanding the challenges that you guys understand well of of improving water quality managing stormwater and meeting these new TMDL mandates is that, yeah. is that that plus why did you come up with this set dollar amount? As uh, because we thought it was a reasonable amount of money to ask for. <laughs> it's not, you know, I mean, we could have a million dollars to, you know, pardon me? One tenth of one percent of the stormwater fee. We started looking at possibly at it as a, a percentage of the stormwater fee. Uh, talked to the city attorney's office and learned that that it isn't possible to use stormwater. Stormwater fees are very strictly, um, you know, uh, regulated and how they can be used. So we can't at because we started looking at maybe we could ask for a small percentage of the stormwater fee to go toward these kinds of incentives. And really, we we came we landed on two hundred thousand um, as you know less than one percent of the the annual stormwater fee that's collected by the city, and I we think that it's a large enough amount that we can do something significant with it, but it's a small enough amount that it has has maybe the potential to be funded. Karen, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Council. The vice mayor just reminded me we have a pretty heavy. Uh, closed session and I got with the city manager and we're going to uh, do the Collier building renovation at a different time. Uh, I'd also suggest uh, if we could go through the liaison or council comments if they could be delayed I'd appreciate but someone has something to say Barbara. Uh, uh, just from the transition area uh, and facility traffic area uh, committee uh, it has been working for well over a year and had uh, some proposed amendments to the comprehensive plan which went to the Planning Commission last week. Um, the Planning Commission uh, chose to defer it indefinitely uh, to come back uh, with the full comprehensive plan review which would be next year at this time. Um, I'm not sure that that is maybe what, uh, what we uh, think is best. We had already had scheduled, because we thought it was going to be coming back to be coming to council in December, already had scheduled for next week's workshop a presentation by um, planning about these amendments. So I would like for that to still occur next Sorry. week, and then you all can decide if we want to uh, make any comment or if there is anything to do. So I would like for that to still come to you all next week. For your uh, information and consideration. Very good. Okay. Item. You probably noticed in the Hampton District Planning Commission uh, legislative package, they have proposed that the regional transportation funding that was dedicated just for roads <coughs> be amended to allow for transit. I've asked the Hampton Roads District for a vote as to how our delegation voted on that matter, but I do plan to individually engage our local delegation, but I do not support that. And we've taken no position on it. Right. Thank you. We'll move to the agenda review there, Mr. Vice Mayor. Under ordinances and resolutions, uh, item 1A uh, will be indefinite deferral. Uh, the uh, item 2, uh, we're going to defer to December the 9th. Uh, Mr. Moss, I understand you're going to abstain on item 3A, is that correct? That's correct. I have a letter on file with you. All right. Uh, and on a, is there any comments on anything else under ordinances and resolutions? Yes. Uh, I just Excuse plan. Three C. Three C. I'm sorry. Say that again. Three C. Three E. Yes. And indefinite. Four A. Okay. <coughs> All right. What were you going to say, John? Bless you. And I plan to vote no on item eight. On item. It's, it's eight on under ordinance and resolutions. No. 
Mr. Mayor. Hampton Boulevard. Correct. Excuse me. You're voting no on that? Correct. Under ordinance and regulation? Correct. Mr. Uh, Mark. I apologize, Mr. Moss. I didn't mean to speak over you. Forgive That's me. Okay. Um, on item 3E, which is you've got speakers, at your individual places there is an amended um, um, Exhibit A. Uh, we've given you a red line. The, the two changes are very minor, and as I understand it, they come out of uh, conversations with the, the Civic League. Uh, it, it, um, it's at the bottom of page 2. Uh, uh, it talks about uh, minimizing noise, odors, and, now, and traffic is added. And then on the very next page, uh, there is a commitment to uh, meet yearly with the Civic League. So we have, when you consider that, we're proposing this as an amended uh, uh, Has amended that been attachment. accepted by the Civic League? I mean... They're gonna, they met last night, and I don't know what their result was, but this came from representatives with the Civic League. Okay, well... See if they come forward and say it's an agreement. This will just, you know, move forward. I will. If, they, if it goes on consent, I'll vote no, and I want to give my reason. Okay. All right. Very good. Well, if it's going to be discussed, it's not going to be on. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I think it's not going to be on. I don't think it is. Okay. Got it. All right. Under planning, uh, item one, Gallion Investors. I understand you're going to abstain, Mr. Sess. Yes, sir. Any all right. Um, so that's Lynn Haven District. Mr. Yeah, there, there's a document or a plan passing around that's a uh, slight modification to the layout that's um, that's requested by the adjoining property owners and the applicant's fine with it. Fort Beach Civic is fine with it. Everybody's okay with it. So, so as modified, right? Yes, sir. Excuse okay. Me. Item two, Burnett uh, Capital Investments and Reed Enterprises. Uh, I'm fine with advice, Mayor. Okay, and I understand you're going to be abstaining. Yes, sir. Uh, Thank you. And I've got a letter on file. Okay. Uh, item three, Evergreen, Virginia, LLC. I understand, Mayor, you're going to be That's correct. abstaining. Please. Uh, that's uh, Kempsville. Amelia, you, you okay? I approve. Vice Mayor. You approve. Uh, Item four, Araceli T. Marshall and uh, Byler Enterprises, Kempsville. Okay. I'm okay with it. This is land sure. it's Item five, Kingdom <laughs> Investing mm -hmm. Outreach Center, the Bayside District. I don't have any problem with it. Uh, item cool. six. <laughs> Five Mile Stretch Associates, Princess Anne, Ms. Henley. I think they're going to be speakers. Okay, we'll Thank pull you. it. <laughs> I'm positive. It's definitely tentative, yeah. <laughs> I got a feeling. I got a feeling. I got a feeling. Yeah. Uh, item seven, the studio, Hampton Roads, LLC, North Landing Investments, Princess Anne, Ms. Henley. I've heard no opposition. Last week, she was there. She came right up to me. What are you doing? Item eight, uh, Ordinances to amend the city zoning ordinance. A, I uh, haven't heard anything about that, but item B, I understand we're going to have indefinite deferral. Uh, yes. City attorney informs me. Yes. <laughs> Is that correct? It, yes, sir. That's my understanding. Talking to staff that they're requesting an indefinite deferral to address some questions that have been raised. Thank All right. You, that's it, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to vote no on item 8A. Oh, 8A. I'm also going to vote no. Barbara and Walsh. John. And Henry. Okay. Okay. Uh, the chair will entertain a motion to recess into a closed session pursuant to the existing <coughs> select meeting by section 2.2-3711A Cutter Virginia as amended for the following purposes. Publicly held property discussion or consideration of the acquisition of real property for public purpose or the disposition of publicly held property or discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body pursuant to section 2.2-3711A3 Beach District, Beach no. District Arena, public contract, discussion of the yeah, award of a public contract involving the expenditure of public funds and discussion of the terms or scope of such contract where discussion in an open session would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body pursuant to section 2.2-3711A29 
Beach District Arena. Personnel matters, discussion, consideration of or interviews of prospective candidates for employment, assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, salaries, disciplining, or resignation of specific public officers, appointees, and employees pursuant to Section 2.2-3711A1, Council Appointments, Council Boards, Commissions, Committees, Authorities, Agencies, Appointees. Do I have a motion? So moved. moved. Second. Do I have a second? Any discussion? Call for the question, please. Aye. 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 I, but I would like to state that I do know Andrea Kilmer. I've had a professionally known her for a long time. Eddie, Eddie Garcia Enterprises has made campaign contributions to my campaign, but it doesn't violate the conflict of interest law, and I'm not abstaining from the issue, but I did want to disclose the relationship. <coughs> Dr. Rose Hammond? Aye. Mr. Earn? Aye. Mrs. Wilson? Aye. Mr. Wood? Aye. Vice Mayor Jones? Aye. Mayor Sesson? Aye. 11 to 0 with the disclosure of Mr. Moss. Very good. If I could ask everyone to step out and we'll get on with the business.